In spatial audio, there are two technologies that are commonly used. One is ambisonics and the other one is Dolby Atmos. In my previous videos, I talked about both of them in some detail, but never in the same video. So I thought it might make sense to create a video that outlines the similarities and differences between ambisonics and Dolby Atmos. And this is what I want to talk about today. But before I do that, first of all, hello, everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I teach at the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design, and spatial audio. If any of that interests you, please consider subscribing and don't forget to press the like button because of YouTube algorithms. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comment section below, or you can also join my Discord server. There's an invite link in the description below. And with that being said, let's get started. Let's start with ambisonics. Now, what exactly is ambisonics? Well, in essence, ambisonics is a way to describe the three-dimensional sound field around a fixed listener position, sometimes also referred to as the sweet spot. Now, what do I mean by that? Essentially, what I mean is that for each direction, so essentially for each longitude and each latitude, uh, I try to capture the amount of sound that is coming from that particular direction in the direction of the of the listener and this can be visualized through what's called a heat map or a power map that essentially kind of gives you some indication on uh, if you have a certain longitude and a, a certain latitude how much sound is coming from that direction uh, and that looks a little bit like this so essentially this would be an example for a visualization from uh, the, the sparta plugin suite i'm going to leave a link to the plugin suite in the description below and that sort of kind of gives you some idea of what we are talking about here so essentially what we have is we have a function over a sphere, uh, a mathematical function over a sphere, and that sort of uh, is what we are trying to describe. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, although they are really fascinating, but they're not really necessary to know. Uh, mathematically speaking, what we are doing is we are deconstructing the sound field with the help of spherical harmonics. And that essentially means we are trying to approximate that uh, function over the sphere with the help of these uh, spherical harmonic basis functions. That's really what's happening here. Now, the easier way to think about that is by uh, thinking of these spherical harmonics as virtual microphones. Uh, these are called virtual microphones because uh, real microphones do not exist with this pickup pattern. Some of these pickup patterns are negative, so you cannot actually create a, a real microphone with this purpose, but you can, uh, you know, calculate with them. And if you calculate it with them, you get a deconstruction of that sound field uh, and each microphone then represents one channel in the ambisonics audio format. When we are talking about ambisonics, we're always also talking about the order of the ambisonics. Uh, so there's a first order ambisonics, a second order ambisonics, a third order ambisonics, and the order really describes how many of these virtual microphones we are actually using. Um, the more microphones we use, the more accurate the, re the representation we'll get. Uh, and these would be the microphones that we would use for first, second, third order ambisonics, or even zeroth order ambisonics, if you want to do that. And it doesn't stop there. So there's a fourth order, fifth order, sixth order. So the more mi of these virtual microphones you actually add, the more accurate uh, your representation will get. But in general, what we do is we usually stop with third order ambisonics. That is usually good enough. Anything be, be Beyond that is really a little bit of an overkill and the uh, returns that you're getting are starting to get to diminish a little. Now, while the math might sound frightening to many, we've actually all been using ambisonics in one form or the other. So, for example, mono is really just ambisonics of order zero. That's really everything there is to it. Or if you're working with stereo, a mid-side processing. Mid-side processing is really just using a portion of first-order ambisonics. The mid-channel is the first channel. The side channel is the second channel in first-order ambisonics. And in reality, you could think of first-order ambisonics as an extension of mid-side processing. Instead of mid -side, doing mid-side processing, in only in one direction, uh, first order ambisonics does mid side processing in all three coordinate directions. So, not only in X, but also in Y and also in C direction. So, some actually think of ambisonics as just a generalization of uh, mid side processing. Now, if we go one step further into virtual reality, YouTube VR, for example, uses uh, first order ambisonics. You might have already heard that. And uh, if we go even one step further, Facebook 360 uses a format that's called Two Big Gears or TBE. And that is a uses a selection of the second order ambisonics channel. Not the exact channels, there's some scaling going on and some phase inversion, but it is essentially a selection of those channels. Now, what, what they have done is they have dropped one of the second order channels, and that is the one that is responsible for second order information in the vertical direction. Now, they can do that because the human ears are not particularly good in perceiving vertical information, so that particular channel is not particularly useful anyway, and therefore you can simply lose it and, and have 
with less channels that allow you to be a little bit more efficient. So that's why I essentially they did it that way. And by the way, I have a video about two big years uh, that I did not that long ago. I'm going to leave a, a link in the description below if you're interested in that particular topic, in that particular format, which is actually a little bit weird. Uh, I invite you to watch that video. But there's one more thing I need to talk about, and that is the fact that there are actually two different types of ambisonics formats. There's an A format and a B format. So what exactly is the difference? Now, the one that we've been talking so far is the B format ambisonics uh, format. And that's the one that we are going to use for virtual reality and all kinds of replication. That's sort of the real ambisonics format. However, the problem is that we cannot record directly in B format. The reason for that is obvious. B format is described with help of these virtual microphones, and we said these virtual microphones don't exist in reality because they have negative pickup patterns, so they are only mathematical constructs. So in order to record ambisonics, we actually need something else, and this something else is the A format ambisonics. So A format really is what is captured by an ambisonics microphone, like the one that is shown here, that's a road first order ambisonics microphone, and it is uh, tied directly to the microphone. So different microphones actually have different A formats. So if you want to actually use that, what we would do is we would record the audio with the microphone, would generate an A-format ambisonics, and then take the A-format ambisonics and convert it into B-format ambisonics and use the B-format ambisonics in our application. Now, when you purchase a microphone, an ambisonics microphone, you will always get also a, uh, a tool that allows you to convert from A-format to B-format because, once again, uh, the uh, A-format is connected and di directly connected to the microphone and different microphones phones might have different A formats. So let's talk about Dolby Atmos. So what exactly is Dolby Atmos? Um, now, in essence, Dolby Atmos is a hybrid format that combines channel-based audio in the form of Dolby Atmos pads with object-based audio in the form of Dolby Atmos objects. The reason you do it that way is because this allows you to combine the advantages of channel-based audio with the advantages of object-based audio. Now, on the channel-based side, you have the bed or the beds. There has to be at least one bed, but there can be multiple beds. And the channels in the bed are directly routed to, are directly mapped to particular speakers in your Dolby Atmos speaker setup. And that allows you to optimize your sound experience with respect to that particular speaker setup. In contrast to that, in Ambisonics, everything is completely speaker agnostic. And if you're producing any Ambisonics audio, you largely rely on the quality of the decoder that uh, the person is using who is listening to your production. In this particular case, with Dolby Atmos, it's different. Because you're now uh, sure that whatever you're producing is exactly what the person who is listening to it is also going to be hearing. And that is a big advantage. At the same time, you also have objects. And these objects are now not only uh, used in order to kind of create the sound field, they are actually captured with all the metadata that is needed to recreate their path or their position or their movement. So the object is not only the sound itself, the object is also the position of the sound. That position is actually in relationship to the listener and the size of that object. So we have a lot of metadata that allows us to re-render that position or that sound as it moves around in space. And that gives us a much, much better uh, experience, three-dimensional experience. Plus, if we would ever add additional speakers or even remove speakers, we can re-render everything because we know for each individual object exactly where it was, at what time, how big it was, and what sound it played. Now, this obviously comes with a couple of limitations. And the first limitation is that uh, because we keep track of each individual object, there's a certain limit on the number of objects that we can use. Uh, above a certain limit, the whole thing becomes impractical, too expensive to compute, uh, because everything has to be done in real time, essentially. Now, in the specifications, the way this is done is that Dolby uh, limits the number of channels to 128. And in addition to that, it limits, limits the number of channels for each bed to 10. And that essentially means because you have to have one bed, that the first 10 channels are going to be the initial bed, and then you have uh, 118 channels left, and these can be either objects or can be additional beds. But you cannot have an unlimited number of objects. So that is, that is sort of the, the main limitation here. Now, the way Dolby Atmos is stored is with the help of Dolby Atmos master files. And uh, a master file contains all the information. So it contains all the bed channels. It contains all the object channels. It contains all the metadata that come with the objects. So all the positional information, or size information, things like that. And uh, there are different formats that you can use for master files. Um, there are some formats that use uh, different files where the metadata and the audio data are stored in different files. Uh, and there are other formats that use 
use everything combined into one file. The one format that is most commonly used with digital audio workstations is the broadcast wave format. Format, uh, and that's one the one that you would get, for example, out of Nuendo or DaVinci Resolve Fairlight. However, the problem with that is that you cannot simply play those master files on a consumer system unless you have a very advanced consumer system. So you need something else that allows people to play that even if they don't have a Adobe Atmos capable system. And here's where the Adobe Digital Plus with joint object coding comes in. That is a file format that uh, we use in order to convert the Adobe Atmos master file in something that can be distributed and uh, listens to on a wide variety of consumer devices. The way this works is that you're taking the master file, the original master file, and you're converting that down or you're rendering it down to a 5.1 surround sound file with additional metadata that allows a Adobe Atmos capable system to reconstruct the Atmos experience. And that essentially means that because you have a 5.1 surround at the center of everything, that can be played anywhere. So as, if you, as soon as you have a system that is capable of playing audio, you will be able to play that Dolby Atmos file. If it's not Atmos capable, it will simply ignore the, uh, the metadata. However, if you have a Dolby Atmos capable system, it can reconstruct the Atmos experience through that metadata that is included in the Dolby Digital Plus with joint object coding file. And that essentially allows you to have a very broad way of distributing Dolby Atmos to pretty much anybody who can play audio. So this leaves me with just one final thing I wanted to talk about, and that is, do I have any recommendations in terms of digital audio workstations? So let's say you are new to spatial audio and you want to get started. Where do you start? What digital audio workstation to get? And for me personally, that's that's actually fairly straightforward. Now, when it comes to Ambisonics, for me personally, there's really only one choice, and that is either Cubase or Nuendo. The reason for that is because these two digital audio workstations have third order ambisonics fully integrated so um, the workflow for virtual reality uh, first second third order is fully integrated you do not need any additional plugins everything is already in there you start up your digital audio workstation and you're ready to go you just tell the system that you're producing an ambisonics and that's it um, the other option would be Reaper. Now, Reaper obviously has the advantage of being able to uh, use tracks with up to 64 channels, and that technically allows you to go beyond third order ambisonics. You can actually go up to seventh order ambisonics. So if you want to experiment with higher order ambisonics, Reaper is the only choice that you have. And uh, in order to do that though, you need plugins. Reaper does not have that natively included, but these plugins are free. And what you can use, for example, is this plug the Sparta plugin suite. That's the one I mentioned at the very beginning of the video and where you find the link in the description below. But that's also a very, 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 very good way to get started. Now, in terms of Dolby Atmos, things are very fluid. Uh, you know, kind of, um, developers of digital audio workstations have been implementing native uh, Dolby Atmos workflows uh, as uh, over the last couple of months. So every every couple of months, a new digital audio workstation comes up with a solution for Dolby Atmos. The ones that are currently very popular are primarily Noendo, that was the first one who had an, a native uh, Dolby Atmos workflow, and more recently Logic, and then obviously many professionals use uh, Pro Tools. Now, before I close, I want to make one final comment, and that is that both Ambisonics as well as Dolby Atmos share one property, and that is the fact that they are both defined with respect to a fixed listener position. In Dolby Atmos, that is the position where you sit in a home theater or movie theater. In terms of uh, ambisonics, it is that sweet spot that defines the center of the sound field which you're approximating, but both these things are fixed. In, and that essentially means that the application of both ambisonics as well as Dolby Atmos is somewhat limited to applications where the location of the listener is fixed. The listener can look around in different directions and get different experience from looking around different directions, but the listener cannot move freely. And that limits the application of both ambisonics as well as Dolby Atmos. So if you are in need of something that is a little bit more flexible, that allows you to do applications that require a six degrees of freedom or kind of free movement of the listener, you need to revert to full object-based audio, like the ones that you would, for example, find in a game engine, like in Unity or in Unreal or in a game audio middleware, like in Vice or FMOD. But you can't really use Ambisonics or Dolby Atmos. Now, that is not to say that both Ambisonics and Dolby Atmos might have the applications in game design. That is obviously the case, but they cannot be the ultimate tool for audio design in games. 
And that's really everything I wanted to say today. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please uh, press the like button and consider subscribing. And uh, once again, if you have any comments or questions, please use the comment section below or join my Discord community. In the link is in the description below. And with that being said, see you at the next video.